We often hear evolutionists claim that there is overwhelming evidence for biological evolution. However, this claim does not stand up to close objective scrutiny. Most of what evolutionists claim as evidence for biological evolution is actually interpretation of evidence based on evolution. This means that evolutionists assume evolution when interpreting evidence and then claim that interpretation has evidence for evolution. This is called circular reasoning, which is a logical fallacy. Biological evolution is always presented as the only scientific explanation for the past and present life on Earth, even when the evidence is so fragmented as to be laughable. We will take a look at some of this alleged evidence and show that not only is it not evidence for evolution, but that it also fits biblical creation. The essence of biological evolution is the universal descent of all life on Earth from a single common ancestor. All of the variety in life is thought to have originated by way of random mutations filtered through natural selection. However, natural selection is too broad of a filter to produce the new specific information needed to go from a single-celled organism to man. Now, small changes are observed in organisms over time, but they are insufficient to accumulate into the large-scale changes needed for evolution, as evolutionists often claim. Evolution requires lots of new information to be created, but these observed changes result from turning on and off and rearranging existing information, or a loss of information. As such, if they accumulate, they will produce a large amount of information loss, resulting in large-scale change in the wrong direction for evolution. Evolution is like pointing to the tree of life, which shows various types of organisms, including man, connected to every other organism through a complex set of branches to the origin of life. However, the lines connecting these organisms exist only in the minds of evolutionists. When you take away these evolutionary presuppositions, all you have are a group of organisms arranged according to some similarities. Evolution is fundamentally atheistic in nature. Not only does it leave no place for God, but any attempt to add him or suggest any intelligence behind the process is met with contempt. This is because the entire purpose of biological evolution is to try to explain our existence apart from God, which is why compromises such as theistic evolution are pointless. It is also why believing in evolution tends to lead people to atheism. Evolution, however, is more than atheistic, but is totally anti-theistic, as is shown by the reaction of its proponents to any suggestion of God or intelligent design. Polygenic trees are projections of the alleged evolutionary relationship between organisms. They are based on comparing one or more traits for similarities and differences. Note has shown here that all of the organisms are on the tips of the branches and not any place else. These polygenic trees are often used as evidence for evolution. However, the exact tree that results often varies with what is being compared. That is, you can take the same organisms, plug in different traits, and get different results. Here is an example from the anti-creationist website Talk Origins. This compares a morphological tree and molecular tree. Now, while most of the organisms are in the same place, Gavia alice is not in the same place or even close in both trees. Here's yet another example from ResearchGate where different traits are compared, resulting in different polyagenic trees. This is a very common occurrence. Note that you can get the polyagenic tree that you want by cherry picking the traits that are compared. It gets even worse because it has been shown that if you put in random data, you still get a polyagenic tree because that is how the program is written. The next slide is the final nail in this piece of evolutionary propaganda. Here are two polygenic trees produced by comparing a rivet, a nail, a screw, and a bolt. As with living things, you get different polygenic trees depending upon which traits you compare. And we know that none of these fasteners were descended from each other, but they were designed for similar purposes. Fossils are the remains of once living organisms found buried in rock. There are three main types of fossils, mineralized, remains, filled casts, and imprints. Here is an imprint fossil of some ferns. 
Now, coal, oil, and gas are often called fossil fuels. However, it needs to be noted that there are arguments against these being the remains of once living organisms. One bit of evidence is this imprint fossil in coal suggesting it is just a form of sedimentary rock. Evolutionists date fossils largely by the rock layers of what they call the geologic time scale that they are found in. Sometimes radiometric dating is used, but it is only seen as valid if it agrees with the geologic time scale. It ignores the fact that fossils are often found out of place according to this geologic time scale. This includes cases like the Ashley phosphate beds in Charleston, South Carolina, where they are all mixed together in the same layer of rock. They include fossil bones of man with dinosaurs, plesiosaurs, whales, sharks, rhinos, horses, mastodons, mammoths, porpoises, elephants, deers, pigs, dogs, and sheep, all in a 40 square mile area. Evolutionists tend to ignore it, but when forced to acknowledge it, they assume some form of reworking occurred without any evidence. Here's a chart of dinosaur fossils showing the alleged family tree. These dotted lines are the inferred relationships between various types of dinosaurs. They are not the result of anything actually found in the fossil record, but are the results of the imaginations of evolutionists interpreting what they think the relationships would be. These light purple lines are missing ancestral lineages. That means there is no evidence that they ever existed. They're just required for evolution to work. These vertical dashed lines are temporal range extensions based on fragmented evidence. They are actually the most scientific part of the additions to this chart. These are the ranges of the fossils actually found, that is, the actual evidence. To strip away the evolutionary assumptions and the extrapolation needed to make evolution work, this is how the real evidence actually looks. Just a bunch of animals found in the ground. Some fossils were first known from fossils before they were found alive. They are called living fossils. One example, the coelacanth, was thought to be extinct for over 100 million years until it was found alive and well in the, in the ocean. This is expected if fossils were a result of the Genesis flood, but not by evolutionary uniformitarian models. Ultimately, the fossil record does not support evolution. The alleged evidence for evolution from the fossil record consists mainly of fossils filled in with evolutionary assumptions and guesswork. Most of the problems creationists have had in dealing with the fossil record comes from trying to explain evolutionary assumptions in terms of the Genesis flood instead of what is actually there. Transitional forms are fossils that are claimed as being transitional between different types of organisms. This is based entirely on the appearance of the organism and the assumption of evolution. Often the order is not what evolution says it should be, and other times they are labeled as related but not direct ancestors because they don't fit evolution good enough. Often they will create a transitional form from fragmented remains. Ampelocetus, an alleged transition to whales, is a good example. The original fossil had no upper front leg, and so the lower front leg was turned into a transitional fin. When better fossils were found, they showed normal land-dwelling front and back legs. Rhodocetus is another example. In this case, no limbs and a partial tail were found. Evolutionists constructed this dolphin with small rear legs and front fins. Since then, more complete fossils have been found, showing them to be land animals, powerful swimmers, but land animals. Myacetus, their next transitional whale, also shows signs of being a land animal, at least part-time. The discovery of a pregnant female shows they gave birth on land and not at sea. Basilosaurus, their next transitional whale, was fully aquatic, with small back limbs that aided reproduction. Not only is there no evidence of a transition from land mammals here, but Basilosaurus was more eel-like than whale-like. These all show how much evolutionary presuppositions influence the reconstruction of fossils. Now here is my favorite transitional form. A spork, you may ask? How is a spork a transitional form? Well, let me show you. A spork is a perfect 
transitional form between a fork and a spoon. And this is pretty much the way evolutionists determine transitional forms. According to evolutionists, humans had a common ancestor with chimpanzees five to seven million years ago. Among the evidence they claim for this theory is that human and chimpanzee DNA is 98.77% similar, which is sometimes rounded down to 98 or up to 99%. What they don't tell you is that to get the 98.77% figure, they actually have to ignore a significant portion of both genomes. What they do is enter a segment of one genome into a computer program that finds the segment most easily aligned with it in the other. They then only count the substitutions, which are places where one nucleotide is swapped for another, and not indels, which are one or more nucleotides that are found in one and not the other. When the indels are added, there is an additional 3% worth of differences, resulting in a similarity of only 95.89% in these easily aligned sections. When all of both genomes are included, the actual percent similarity between humans and chimpanzees is only 67.1%, which is a far cry from the 98.77% similarity quoted by evolutionists. The 32.9% difference totally destroys the notion that humans and chimpanzees had a common ancestor. Now, the measured mutation rate is 3.8 mutations per person. Now, assuming no mutations are lost over time, which would not be the case, but it does produce the fastest mutation rate, the 98.77% figure would still have over 19 million differences and take 9.9 .9 million years to accumulate. The 95.89% figure would have more than 46 million differences and take 23 million years to accumulate. And the 67% similarity figure would have a little over 532 million differences and would take 171 million years to accumulate. Now all of these figures are way above the 5 to 7 million years evolutionists give for the time that we had a common ancestor with chimpanzees. Most of the alleged evidence for human evolution comes from fossils that they claim to be different species of humans. However, a close look shows these are just varieties that occurred in mankind during the post babel dispersion. The biggest problem is the differences in mitochondrial DNA, but evolutionists usually assume constant rates. Now this is a reasonable assumption with a large population size such as 1 over 100,000, because such populations tend to average out extremes. However, the extremes could have been the norm in some small isolated groups during the post-flood Babel dispersion. The grouping and other genetic factors are consistent with small, isolated groups rather than large populations. At the nuclear DNA mutation rate of 38.8 mutations per generation, only five generations would be required to get 200 differences and 10 to get 400. This is only 150 to 300 years. In any event, they are close enough to living humans to be fully human. For example, there is more genetic variety among dogs. The fossil known as Lucy is a specimen of Orthopithecus afarensis. At the time of its discovery, it was the most complete Orthopithecus skeleton ever found, but still only about 40% complete. Orthopithecus means southern ape. This knee is also associated with Lucy, but was not found with the Lucy skeleton. Called a Hadar knee, or Johansson's knee, it is claimed as evidence that Orthopithecus afarensis walked upright. It needs to be noted that this knee has a carrying angle of 15 degrees, while the human leg has a carrying angle of only 9 degrees. The Latoli footprints are a trail of two sets of footprints, one from an adult and one from a child. Because these clearly human footprints are dated to 3.7 million years old, they are attributed to Orthopithecus afarensis because humans are not thought 
by evolutionists to have existed yet. This has been used to support the claim that Ophelopithecus walked upright like humans. The adult was quite short at four feet tall, short but within the low range of human norms. The footprints themselves are totally consistent with the prints of a habitually unshod human foot. In fact, the only reason for not concluding that these are human footprints are the evolutionary presuppositions that blind evolutionists to it. This has led to reconstructions of Lucy and Ophelopithecus in general as walking upright with an ape-like head and a rather hairy human-like body and, of course, human-like feet. They even included whites in the eyes and a thoughtful gaze despite the fact that apes have black eyes and not white eyes. This is all done for propaganda purposes and is based completely on evolutionary assumptions. One problem was that the way Lucy's pelvis went together as found resulted in it flaring out like that of a chimpanzee. This indicated that Ophelopithecus afarensis walked on all fours like all other apes, but evolutionists needed Lucy to walk upright. Otherwise, Ophelopithecus afarensis could not have made the Leotoli footprints, leaving humans as the only possible source. It needs to be noted that having an upright walking ape is no problem for creation science, since there are other reasons, such as genetics, why humans could not have evolved from an ape-like ancestor. However, evolutionists desperately need Ophelopithecus to walk upright to have a non-human source for the Litoli footprints. The following video from Nova's Lucy Search for Human Origins Part 1 shows how they handled this. Lucy turned old predictions upside down. It was thought the missing link would be a smart ape that walked on all fours. Here was the skeleton of a creature that looked like it could walk like us, but with many ape-like features. The ape that stood up, it was a revolutionary idea. We needed Owen Lovejoy's expertise again, because the evidence wasn't quite adding up. The knee looked human, but the shape of her hip didn't. Superficially, her hip resembled a chimpanzee's, which meant that Lucy couldn't possibly have walked like a modern human. But Lovejoy noticed something odd about the way the bones had been fossilized. When I put the two parts of the pelvis together that we had, this part of the pelvis has pressed so hard and so completely into this one that it caused it to be broken into a series of individual pieces which were then fused together in later fossilization. After Lucy died, some of her bones lying in the mud must have been crushed or broken, perhaps by animals browsing at the lake shore. Uh, this has caused the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they are in an anatomically impossible position. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bones seem to flare out like a chimp's. But all was not lost. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. Now it needs to be noted that there are evolutionists that don't accept this reconstruction, though many do accept it and even defend the method used. The fact that he had to use a power saw on the replica pieces shows that this reconstruction is not a natural fit, but a contrivance of evolutionary assumptions. Furthermore, there are other reasons to doubt this reconstruction. Here's another specimen of Ophelopithecus afarensis, known as fossil STS-14. This highly incomplete fossil is also sufficiently fragmented that some of the gaps were filled in with plaster. 
Now, this fossil is used as further evidence that Ophelopithecus afarensis walked upright. However, a closer look at the hips of this fossil show that they don't quite match. This mismatch is even more obvious when the fossil is reconstructed to resemble human hips and tailbone. In fact, this comparison shows that the right hip more closely resembles a human hip than the left one. Furthermore, the joint between the tailbone and the left hip shows a notch that suggests that the connection is not quite natural and that the left hip may actually belong at a different angle. This difference also suggests that the right hip may actually be that of a human being, while the left hip belongs to an Ophelopithecus. This suggests that the correct hip angle is actually flaring out like that of a chimpanzee and Lucy's original hip configuration. Lucy's leg bone is often shown at the same angle as a human leg bone. This makes great propaganda since it makes Ophelopithecus afarensis look more human. However, when the top of Lucy's leg is aligned with the top of a human leg, the joints do not match up, suggesting that Lucy's leg had a different angle. When this correction is made, the angle is more in tune with the 15 degree angle of the head or knee rather than the 9 degree angle of a human leg. However, it is also a perfect match to the leg of a chimpanzee, which has no carrying angle. The fact that Lucy's femur does not line up with a human femur goes against the idea that Ophelopithecus was a human ancestor and that they walked upright. The fact that it is almost a perfect match to the femur of a chimpanzee supports the original reconstruction of the pelvis. Furthermore, a carrying angle of 15 degrees is not what we would expect from human-like bipedal motion since the human carrying angle is only 9 degrees. In fact, a 15 degree carrying angle is actually unusually high. Humans have a 9 degree carrying angle. Gorillas and chimps have 0 degrees. However, orangutans and spider monkeys both have 9 degrees like a human does. And both of these walk on all fours and live in trees. Now studies of the feet of Ophelopithecus not only show that they had an ape-like big toe, but that it was fully designed for dwelling in trees. Furthermore, they could not have made the Latale footprints, which were made by a human-like foot and not an ape-like foot. The conclusion is that the Latale footprints had to have been made by a human being. Here is a comparison between Lucy's finger, a human finger, and the finger of a chimpanzee. As you can see, Lucy's finger does not match a human finger, but is more curved. However, it is a good match to the curvature of a chimpanzee finger. This shows that the curvature of Ophelopithecus fingers and toes closely resemble those of chimps and other apes. Along with the fact that Ophelopithecus wrists locked, this evidence suggests that they were knuckle-walking tree-dwelling apes and not human ancestors. Here's an illustration of how Lucy died based on the condition of the fossils. Yes, she fell out of a tree. The conclusion on Ophelopithecus being a human ancestor is that despite the propaganda, the evidence says no. This was what the real Lucy looked like, a knuckle-walking, tree-dwelling ape and not a human ancestor. Evolutionists are quite good at producing pictures and statues that make the evidence seem to support evolution, but when their presuppositions are stripped away, the facts show the opposite. Homo habilis means handyman and is based on what is thought to be stone tools also found at Olduvia Gorge. Homo habilis has a cranial capacity of 500 to 800 cubic centimeters. However, the placement in genus Homo that is human has been questioned even by evolutionists. Homo habilis most likely should belong to Ophelopithecus. The features of the skull, from eye sockets, the facial slant, lack of protruding and internal nasal bones, makes it too ape-like to belong to genus Homo. This chart shows the results of multivariate analysis of the ankle bones of hominids and apes by evolutionist C.E. Ornard. It not only shows that Hibalus is far closer to Ophelopithecus than humans, but it also shows that both are closer to orangutans than the other great apes and man. Ornard concluded, based on this and other factors, that Hibalus was an Ophelopithecus and that neither of them were human ancestors. 
There was no evidence that these alleged tools were actually found with Hibalis, but were simply found in the area such that it is not clear if they actually belonged to them. Also, looking at these so-called stone tools, it is doubtful that they were even artificial constructs, but they look like they could just be natural rocks. So Homo habilis had a crinal capacity of 500 to 800 cubic centimeters, the low end of which is consistent with a large end cranial capacity from established off of Epithecus of 530 cubic centimeters. Also, the fragmented nature of Hibalis fossils makes correlating body and brain size impossible. However, it is the ape-like facial features that give Hibalis away as being an ape in part of Ophelopithecus. Homo erectus had a flat human face with both internal and external nasal bones, though they had a below average cranial capacity. They had a cranial capacity of 750 to 1225 cubic centimeters with an upper range within that of living human beings. They averaged 900 cubic centimeters, which is just short of the 950 cubic centimeter lower limit for living human beings. But the smallest cranial capacity of 750 cubic centimeters is more than twice that of a human newborn at 369 cubic centimeters. This is the Homo erectus skeleton known as Turkinoboy or KNM-WT15000. This fairly complete skeleton of this estimated 8 to 9 year old boy shows they were clearly human with a height of 5 foot 3 inches. He was within human norms and probably would have been more than 6 foot as an adult. Having been found in Africa, Asia, and Europe, Homo erectus used fire and stone tools. This facial reconstruction shows they were quite human. The fact is that Homo erectus was just one of several now apparently extinct branches of mankind. Homo hypogenus, while claimed as a human ancestor, are clearly just a variety of human beings. A prime piece of evidence is that they had an average skull capacity of 1,220 cubic centimeters, which is well within the range of living humans. There's also evidence of a broken but internal nose bone. Homo hybrogenus also have a definite nose ridge bone, as shown in this picture. Furthermore, Homo hybrogenus shows an unslanted face of a human being. This skull also shows evidence of surgery in the form of a small hole probably made to relieve internal pressure. Here is an honest facial reconstruction of Homo hybrogenus revealing a clearly human face. There can be no question that Homo hybrogenus was simply a variety of human being and not an evolutionary ancestor. Homo florensis, also known as hobbits, was a group of small skeletons found in the island of Flores off the coast of Indonesia. They are quite short with appropriately smaller skulls at about three and a half feet high. The proportions fit those of human beings, just smaller than normal. All indications are that these were simply a very small family of the human race. This is a comparison of a hobbit and a normal human skull. The hobbit skull has the internal nasal bone that is typical of humans. Homo florensis is clearly a small variety of human being, showing how much variety arose in the post-Babel dispersion. Neanderthals are what most people think of when they think of cavemen. However, they have suffered much from evolutionary presuppositions in reconstructions. They had flat faces with internal and external nasal bones, showing that they were quite human. In fact, Neanderthals even had a larger skull capacity than we do. This special reconstruction of a Neanderthal shows a very human face and possibly a sample of an isolated post babel group of humans. There are also genetic markers that indicate interbreeding with those labeled Homo sapien, showing clearly that they were human beings. This is all based on reconstructions and descriptions by evolutionists. Unfortunately, creationists seldom get free access to major fossils. However, creationist Dr. Jack Curso did get such access to some ancient human skulls to photograph and x-ray them. He took full advantage of the opportunity to study these skulls. Cuso published his results, and they can be found in his book, Buried Alive, 
published in 1998. He found that in some cases, such as this Neanderthal child's skull, that the jaw was placed unnaturally forward, making the face appear more ape-like. When the jaw was put into its natural position, the face looked far more human. He also found evidence that the rate at which this child was maturing was way slower than modern norms. This is supported by this chart showing that the age at which children mature has actually decreased over the last couple hundred years. Not only did the evidence show that ancient man matured slower than we do today, but also that the shape of Neanderthal skulls is consistent with the face growing and filling out as one gets older. Kusa's measurements showed them to be consistent with the skulls of people who lived for hundreds of years as described in the Bible. So not only are Neanderthals clearly human, but they show evidence of the long lives described in the Bible. It should not be too surprising that we should find men living in caves during the post-Babel dispersion. When you are on the move away from civilization, caves make good places to seek shelter from weather and predators. Caves would naturally be temporary places to stay when there is no nearby civilization and you have not found a place to settle down. A cave would also be a convenient place to live while you are building in a place you choose to settle down. The point is, living in caves is not a sign of primitives coming up from being animals, but of men who have gone away from civilization for one reason or another. The Bible even tells of David taking refuge in caves while on the run from King Saul. If humans evolved from a common ancestor with apes, we should expect to see a fairly smooth progression from ape to human. Evolutionists produce the illusion of this by making some groups of humans look more ape-like and some apes look more human-like. They have even classified an ape as genus homo to complete the illusion of a smooth progression. However, this illusion does not stand up to close scrutiny. The more human-like apes, Ophelopithecus, are shown to be just as ape-like as chimpanzees. Those features that make them seem more human-like are actually contrivances of evolutionary presupposition. Their linchpin species, Homo habilis, should be classified as Ophelopithecus, not Homo, making it an ape. The rest of genus Homo are clearly human beings and not ape men, with most suffering from degrees of evolutionary presupposition. You'll sometimes see a chart like this that is intended to show an increase in skull size over time. Now, the original paper does not include information on where these fossils were found, and they do not include how much of the skull was found, but most importantly, they do not include how the dates were arrived at. It is therefore quite likely that this chart is largely a result of evolutionary presupposition. Now this is what the evolutionists want you to see when you look at this chart, a nice smooth progression of increasing skull size. But if you take a close look at this chart, you'll see three distinct segments with significant breaks. The first one consists entirely of Ophipithecus afarensis and Africanus. The second one consists of Ophelopithecus robustus and Boises and Homo habilis. This grouping further supports the idea that habilis should actually be classified as an Ophelopithecus. Now there may be one Homo erectus skull in here. It's a little hard to tell because the resolution of the original image is not good enough to be certain. The third batch consists of genus Homo, including Homo erectus, Neanderthal, and modern humans. This group consists entirely of human beings. Despite the fact that even the relative dating probably suffers much from evolutionary presupposition, we can still draw some interesting conclusions from these results. First of all, given the smaller time span of creation science, it needs to be noted that this chart would represent the order in which these organisms died and not the order in which they were born. This has a significant effect on how you interpret the evidence. Now it needs to be noted that very special conditions are needed for the preservation and fossilization of bones. Among them are rapid burial. This means that at least the first two groups need to be a result of some form of disaster. 
Now, Ophiopithecus fossils are only found in a relatively small part of Africa. It is therefore likely that these Ophiopithecines were killed in one or two local disasters, resulting in the preservation and fossilization. It should be noted that there is no increase in skull size within this group. This group is probably also found in the same part of Africa. This suggests that they all died in a local disaster which rapidly buried them, preserving their bones for fossilization. It needs to be further noted that like the previous group, there is no generally upward trend in skull size. It is only by putting these two groups together do you get any hint of an increase in skull size. Now this final group consists entirely of genus Homo, which means they were human beings. The increased number of specimens could be a result of the fact that humans tend to bury their dead, thus preserving more remains to be found. Now this group does have a trend of increasing skull size. However, it is not absolute. One possible explanation is that these individuals with smaller skulls had more problems than just having smaller skulls. There may have been other physical deformities that caused them to not live as long. But the point is evolution only wants you to see the data their way, with their interpretation, when there are other ways of looking at the same data. In all fairness, most evolutionists are probably blind to the fact that there are other ways of looking at the same data. All of the evidence claimed for evolution falls under one or more of the following three categories. Assumes evolution and common descent. Assumes only natural causes, that is, excludes God or any other intelligence. Assumes that an independent origin would be random. Evidence claimed for transitions tend to be fragmented, with evolutionary presuppositions filling in the blanks. With humans, we have ape and human fossils with no real connection between them. Meanwhile, some apes are made to look more human, and some humans are made to look more like apes, based on evolutionary presuppositions. When hearing of claimed evolutionary evidence, do not take the reporting and lecturing at face value. Always try to find original papers and at least pictures of original evidence when possible, because the actual evidence in original papers are never as good as the hype reported around it. Nothing destroys a good evolutionary argument like the original paper and original evidence.